Okay, my name is Robin Trinkle Russell, and I'm presenting the slides uh, of a trip that Gary and I took last October. And I'm on the island. That's the other thing you should say where you are. Okay. Paula? And I'm Paula Weiss, and I'm on the island in Russell Bay, near where Robin lives. Okay. Oh, I had a question. Are we supposed to mute when we get started or? Thank you, that's a great point. If everybody would um, mute their uh, machine when they're not the speaker, and the way you can do that is in the lower left-hand corner in most views, if you hover in that lower left-hand corner, you'll see a mute uh, button. Um, and actually you probably can do it. Um, yeah, that's probably the main easiest way to do that. Thanks. I had another question. Um, I thought Susie was going to talk about next month's, Susie Saxel was going to talk about next month's book. She just called me and she said she has a mix up on the time. She's at her sister's birthday party or sister in law's birthday oh. party. Well, I can so, do it. I can sure. podger it okay. together. Okay. okay. Lynn? I'm unmuting. Hi, I'm Lynn Levitsky, and I'm on the island now. We arrived August 1st and full hazmat suit with goggles and N95 <laughs> masks on Delta. And we're going back the same way September 3rd, sadly, because of the situation. But we're on Sunset Bay, and we're loving our time here. Wow. Great. Bill and Nancy, I think you have a machine near your speaker or something because we we keep waiting for you to speak. Well, you know, the boxes are not in the same order on everybody's computer. So we had no idea when it was our turn because <laughs> we would have thought that we were between Joe and Robin. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway. So we're on the island. Yep, we're on the island and uh, that's... Here we are. We're we're riding our bikes mostly around the uh, north end because there's there are too many people here, which is probably not fair for me to say. But <laughs> anyway, so, so Phyllis, we went by your driveway today. You did. Yep. That's nice. Did everything look okay? <laughs> Only for the ten feet we could see. Yes. <laughs> it is very lonely. <laughs> So we're Phyllis and Gary, and we are up in Tucson or down in Tucson, wishing we were on Madeline. So we're looking forward to tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm Rachel Bauman, and I am on the island. Also looking forward to tonight. Thanks, Robin, for preparing Welcome. everything for us. Sure. And I'm Deb from Northern Minnesota from Bemidji. Tomorrow I'll, I'll be on B Dock with my husband on our 40 foot okay. Valiant. Looking forward to that. And I attended last month's um, reading and really enjoyed it. So I'm looking forward to tonight also. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. I'm Sarah Renner and I'm here on the island. Happy to be with everybody. Enjoyed the book. Good. Linda? Oh, she's on mute. Mm -hmm. Oh, Linda? Again, Linda. Linda, can you hear us? <clears throat> you need to unmute. Maybe I can try and help you with there, that. There, there, I got it. Okay, okay. Oh, cool. Uh, I'm back in Iowa in case you didn't hear that part. Sorry not to be up there, but. Mm -hmm. We're having a little cool spell here, which is nice. Good. And Jenna? Jenna, are you there? Jenna? You may well, be we having can... some reception problems. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Okay. So um, do you want to talk, Paula, about next month? 
Paul is on mute too. I'm on mute. That's easy to forget. Anyway, our next book for um, September, I'm sorry, I can't remember the date. I think it's, it's the 15th. 15th, that sounds right, Tuesday, 7 p.m. And we'll be Zooming and uh, with Z Joe's help. And the book is uh, Virgil Wander by Leif Inger, which I think Lynn Levitsky originally recommended to us mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and then mm -hmm. kind of caught on. But he's an author uh, that most of you are familiar with from uh, Minnesota PBS, is that correct? Or the radio station or anyway. NPR. Mm -hmm. NPR. NPR. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Heyer has uh, made a contact to him to see if there's any chance he can join us for the Zoom. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book, is about a small town life again in northern Minnesota. It's a charming tale about second chances and love and everything. So it, it's an enjoyable read. I already read it. It was quite good. good. Lynn, did you have anything to add? <laughs> okay. I'll mute then. Okay, I so, tried very hard to make it since I did recommend it a couple of years ago, but I actually have an evening clinic with an hour difference in Boston that day. So I'm going to try to move things around so I can make it. I can't oh, be good. on the book group and seeing patients at the same time. Though, so. Oh, and Siri <laughs> said <work> out. <laughs> and Siri said there shouldn't be any problem getting copies because all of them are coming locally that she's requested. So this time okay. there shouldn't be any problem getting copies for the library to interlibrary to borrow. Good, good. Anything, Joe, or are we ready to go for the slideshow? Mind us of the title of the next book, Paula. And the author. Virgil Wander is Virgil, the title. V-I-R-G-I-L, Wander, by Leif, L-E-I-F, Anger, E-N-G-E-R. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna mute now. Me too. Okay, so I gotta go uh, share screen, pick this up. Okay. Okay, is that, uh, why do I have, do I flatten you, Joe? Or? <clears throat> You, you might have to just put that up in the little upper left right hand corner. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I didn't have it before, or I'll just throw it over there. Okay. No. Um, let's see. Hmm. There, we got where. Okay, let's see. Put it over here. Okay. So, um, Let's go back up here. Okay. Okay. The book we're reading tonight is Rome, History and Seven Stackings by Matthew Neal. Um, what I read from the book jacket was that he was a long-term resident of, of Rome. And I saw a review of this in USA Today. Um, and that's why I ordered it through Siri. But I stayed with the book because of Matthew's ability to humanize a crossroads of the world. That's Italy. And Gary and I took a trip to Italy last October. This is the map of our trip from Smithsonian. We flew into Milan, we're there about 10 minutes, and then off to Stressa, which is in the Italian Lake District. Um, this is the view from the uh, roof bar at our hotel. This is a view of a hotel that's on the promenade of Stressa. Um, I like the picture because it, it shows that it's a, a semi-tropical region. And you can see the Borromean Island in the, in the background. And there are resorts like Stressa all around the lake. Stressa was first mentioned in the late 900s by the Romans. Um, it was a fishing village and a place where the Italians, well, after the Romans, 
and then when the Italians would have their resort villas, and right and nowadays it's a um, uh, a vacation resort place for the Italians. Um, Stressa kind of reminded me a little bit of Madeline Island because people come there to enjoy the scenery, to enjoy the water, to enjoy the summer, to enjoy um, the warm weather. It's a um, it's a beautiful city. And uh, we were there kind of in the off season. But this hotel next to uh, our hotel, I mean, it's not in good shape. And I don't know if anybody's ever going to fix it up. But two other owners of a hotels uh, in the city had gotten together to buy it. And I think they're trying to, well, I don't know if they take it down, but they don't want um, it to reflect negatively on the town. So they have bought it and they have plans to do something there. This is Palacio Borromean. Um, it was that island we saw out in, uh, in the background of the last photo. It's on Lake Magori. And it was built um, a long time ago um, for the uh, visiting dignitaries and the bankers. Because a lot of Northern Italy is the economic engine of Italy, uh, especially Milan. And that brings me to the point of um, this whole trip was in an area uh, where the initial European outbreak of the coronavirus, because Milan does so much uh, international trade and it's a fa fashion capital and they uh, deal with the Far East as far as suppliers, there's a lot of um, people back and forth be between Wuhan and Milan. And they believe that the coronavirus, it's a different strain in Europe than in the Far East, but uh, it was a very hotbed in Milan. The other thing that spread the virus um, significantly besides the uh, travel back and forth is the uh, Milan hosted a soccer game between Italy and Spain. The COVID-19 had already uh, broken out, but the soccer fans couldn't stand it, so they had to have the game, and that spread it even further in the uh, continent. Um, we went to that island, which was the uh, a palace that was built to uh, impress a lot of people and um, create a sense of confidence in the banking system. And this is how we got, how we got around on uh, Lake Magori with these small launches. They were just like, um, just like little um, hummingbirds all over and you know you could go wherever you wanted. And if you notice in the picture, there were uh, small resort little towns kind of like, like Hayward and Bayfield and Washburn with places to stay all around the lakes. This is Barolo Winery. This was um, one of our next stops. Um, and actually you can find this wine in like a, a nicer wine store. Um, they make both reds and whites. And uh, this area again was very hard hit by the, the COVID. From uh, Stressa, we did some side trips, then we went to uh, Barolo Winery, and then we ended up in uh, Santa Margareta, which is just uh, past that hillside. This is Portofino, Italy. Um, I don't know if anyone has been there, but it is like um, Portofino was mentioned by the Romans, also um, by Pinny the Elder, um, just after Christ was born. So a lot of these um, small villages in uh, Italy were fishing villages and they were, most all of them were on the uh, Roman uh, roads in Italy. So they have, and different ones have, have um, kept some of the old ruins, a lot of them were taken down. So Portofino was like the place to have your yacht and 
uh, some of the pictures on, you can see that yacht on the left, huge, um, where you wanted to be seen. Um, nowadays it has, uh, has a ferry that comes from Mar Santa Margareta and, you know, day visitors can come over and that's how we came over. You see that road in the background, kind of in the, uh, the right third, um, going uh, halfway down the hillside. Because of uh, rains, uh, that road washed out for, um, for you know, several weeks and uh, some people were killed. Um, the climate change has had a big impact you know, on Italy as, as other places. Um, and the road is kind of like in California where they have, first you have some fires and then you have big rains and then, you know, the road, the upper hillside collapses on the road. But Portofino is beautiful and uh, uh, a fair number of people, but it's uh, different colored buildings and um, a lot of history there. This is Porto Veneri. This is, um, we were supposed to go to the Cinque Terre, which is, uh, I'm probably saying that wrong. Cinque, whatever. Five hillside villages on the Mediterranean. And normally you would be able to, there's a mm -hmm. train that runs along the hillside up above and you could um, get off at different places and then walk hiking paths between the villages. But when we were in uh, Santa Margarita, after the day after we went to Porto Fino, there was a rain. And I can remember I had um, gone to see a museum by myself and was coming back. And like the water was running down the sidewalk. It was like about two inches, two inches deep. And, you know, I was totally soaked. And because of the hillsides collapsing and the one next to Porto Fino years before, um, you know, they weren't sure if something would happen to the railroad tracks or some of the hiking paths. Um, they basically closed down the whole uh, Cinque Terre. And so we took the bus from Santa Margarita to uh, Porto Veneri, which was the first little village to the east of the Cinque Terre. And I would have to say that this was, was a small restaurant, but probably the best food I had in Italy. I had uh, mussels with red sauce. And it was to die for. This is Spacia. Uh, I looked up these pronunciations, but I can't remember what it is. Spacia. Um, this is on the way to uh, Florence. It's just past Porto Veneri. Um, Italy was a huge military um, producer. And I mean, and this was a military museum. Uh, the guide was kind of, uh, they were running out of ideas because we got rained out of Cinque Terre, which is supposed to be one of the primary uh, destinations of this tour. And so they were looking at anything they could do. And so we, the one museum that was open on the day was the military museum. And so we saw a lot of guns and submarines <laughs> and and we actually did see some ornaments from uh, like the, the figureheads at the front of a boat. They had a huge uh, collection of that and that was beautiful. But this, I don't know if you can see, but that is like the um, barrel of a, um, like a uh, battle gun. And that thing has split like a flower. So I would say that was a bad thing whenever they shot that cannonball off. I don't know how it would have done, but to have broken the metal like that so that it looks like a um, dandelion is pretty severe. And when the Second World War, when Italy uh, and Mussolini joined with um, Hitler, um, there was a lot of bombing of Italy to try to take out some of the munitions um, and the um, ammunition, things like that. Uh, this is, I think this is from Siena, I'm not sure, but most of the cities or the city states in Italy had uh, exterior walls for defense. So they'd make them bigger, thicker, taller, 
until they came with um, gunpowder and um, the walls no longer worked as defense or catapults and things like that. And this wall reminded me of the book we read with um, the China, the Great Wall of China. And people always uh, will say, well, why didn't they preserve this? Or why didn't they preserve that? Or why didn't they preserve? Uh, but you know, when you have history going back to the Romans, and then like within the book, you have periods of um, poverty and um, pestilence and the plague, and people were just trying to survive. So they would take these walls apart. And that happened in Italy too. So there are certain cities that were in the backwater, kind of like Savannah, that things were preserved. But in other places, like with the Great Wall, they would take them apart for building materials for something else. So this was a, um, this one was preserved. This is Siena. It was a, a beautiful city, it was a side trip. Um, and we were up on a, an overlook and I don't know how I got this photo, but I did. And it doesn't, I didn't shake my hands too much either, so. Um, while we were staying in Florence, we of course got to see David and um, the Medici uh, collection of everything. The Medici family basically owned Florence and um, were very generous and um, they acquired many, many, many beautiful paintings and sculptures and um, carvings and it was it was overwhelming to see all that history and the churches one thing i did i liked and i took a lot of pictures of were the floors and the marble work and in siena we were told that um the marble floors are so mm, fragile and that they they would cover them with tarps all year long and they'd open them up in October. And so we got to see the floors in Siena, in the Siena Cathedral. The, and I mean, those are all pieces of, my, it's beautiful. This is Bolzano from Florence. We moved on and Bolzano is in the North. It's, it's Italy, but it's more German Austrian than Italy. And there's the Dolomites in the background. And this is where Itzy, the frozen man that was up in the Alps. They had a museum there for him. That was really interesting. This is Gary boarding the water taxi to Venice. So this is the airport, which is kind of on the outskirts of Venice. Venice being 118 islands. Um, so it's kind of an interesting transportation system. When we left Venice, we had to get up at, well, I don't know why we went to bed. I mean, we had to get up at like 2.30 and be out there at 3.30 to pick up the water taxi to get the airport by 5.30 and then leave on the six o'clock plane. So it's interesting. This is uh, Venice, a gondola boatyard. Um, I think there's like 400 gondola licenses in Venice. And every uh, couple of years, they have to be retrofitted I mean, like they have to be painted and they're black and they will have different um, carvings on the front. And a woman is going to be taking over this business from her dad, a young lady. And um, she was pretty impressive, but um, it was a tour we went there. And uh, this is Venice. We um, took this picture from the top floor of a museum. It's a beautiful city. We were there in Venice two weeks before it flooded. And so everything we saw had like six feet of water in two weeks. Okay, and so this is, these are just some of the questions I had uh, or just thought of, but I'm going to stop sharing here. Let's see, where are we? Does anybody see? Oh, there's my mouse. Okay, so I'm sure. So, 
Thank you, Robin. And I just want to welcome Mark, who arrived just as we were beginning. Uh, hi, Mark. He's on mute. Okay. Um, well, one of the first questions I had is, did you like the book or the subject? And I, what were we going to do, Joe? Have people like... I, I thought um, if people will just show by their raising their hand, hey, I have something to say, then Robin can sort of say, hey, would you speak now? And uh, that way we won't all be trying to talk at once. Joe, do you want us to unmute only if we speak, or do you want us all to unmute? Yeah, why don't you just remain on mute, and then when it's, you're speaking, uh, then uh, uh, unmute, and then go back on mute. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well, I will start by confessing that I did not read the book, but I was so enchanted by the about the book and the presentation, so I'm here prior to my reading it. <laughs> However, I have read the previous book, and I and I am reading the the book for September. So, um, and I have t I have traveled in the Tuscany area to Florence and Siena and um, Montepulciano and Montalcino and things like that. So I was really interested in in seeing the slides, and they're beautiful. Thank you, Robin. We've been to Italy as well, and just it just brought back so many memories, Robin. Just loved it. You know, we were in Venice maybe a year ago, and um, golly, it just was a beautiful, fun spot. And we've been to Rome, and um, the book was hard. I, for me, there was just so much detail. Um, we did print some things to help us understand a little better. And in fact, there's a nice summary at under history stories where actually the author kind of capsulized each of the different sections. That was a huge help. Um, and we didn't, fin we haven't finished it. I don't, I don't know if I will. Um, it just oh. overwhelmed me. Gary, what did you think? I think much the same. <laughs> yeah, interesting, but a tremendous, yeah. it made me go back and print off some of the best sites, the Colosseum and the Forum, and to get thinking about Rome too. And, and the amazing thing as to how much of it has survived to tell its tale. You know, what's going to survive out of our eras? Not much, <laughs> probably. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's our take on it. I'm going to mute. Yeah, I was going to say um, before that, I appreciate people reading it. I know it's really deep. And I mean, it, it's so packed with details that it's hard to, you know, I mean, I read it twice, but it's like, uh, mm -hmm. you, could, you could get a four year degree in all this subject and still not get it all. Yeah. Good. Thanks for sharing. Um. I, I liked, I enjoyed, well, I, I really liked the topic of Rome. Um, and I'm a history buff, so I liked all of the history going way back uh, before the time of Christ. And I felt like I learned so much about the different eras, uh, some of which I knew, but there was a lot that I didn't know. Um, but I did find the book yeah. tedious. Um, and too much, I felt like there was too much detail at times. And I also felt like some of the, the sackings uh, done by the various uh, peoples from the, from the North, uh, from other parts of Europe, they got, it got to be kind of same old, same old. Um, but what I really enjoyed was the descriptions of the place and the people of Rome themselves. And I found the last chapter about the Nazis and Mussolini, uh, because, and I'm uh, sort of a, a world war buff too. So I, uh, I really enjoyed, I, I didn't realize some, I hadn't read a lot about Italy's role in the war or Mussolini either. Um, and I also had an uncle who uh, was part of the campaign that went from Africa up through Italy. So, you know, that just kind of brought back uh, uh, some memories in that regard, but 
overall, I, I enjoyed it and I did finish it. Oh, good. Robin, I'm, I'm noticing Lynn has had her hand up for a while. I did put my little hand thing up there. Well, so I have been, I did not actually, I skimmed the chapter on the most recent history and I read the rest and I found it fascinating mostly because I had just completed a sort of an adult alumni course taught by a guy who's a professor of religion who was head of the Yale Divinity School on the Gnostics, which were people with kind of different religious beliefs early on in the second and third centuries where a whole bunch of documents had been found in 1970 and they've finally been categorized and really talking about how the Christian religion got codified in the fourth century and then going on and on from that really. This really continues on from my class that I just took. And I, I think the guy has an axe to grind. You know, his other non-fiction -book, book is an atheist history of belief. And what he's really talking about through most of it is um, the days when the Pope did have lesions, unlike the lesions that he didn't have when Hitler was invading. Um, but but he he really talks about the the um, the earthly power of of the Catholic Church, I think, in a very big way. And he he has a jaded view, which he brings great humor to, I would say. So I think that, that may be his major focus, although he talks about a lot of sackings. What he's really talking about is um, something else, I think. I think he had an er topic in mind when he wrote this somehow. That was my take. Also, um, uh, Robin, don't feel bad about missing Cinque Terre. I sent you an email about it. Okay. Two years ago in the fall, I think we were supposed to overlap in Chicatero. We went. It was so crowded with uh, tourists from all over the world, tour groups. It was impossible. It wasn't that scenic. And we, I don't know why people love it. It was crazy. We, After two days, we left and went to Genoa, which is a wonderful city. And we had a great time. We had dinner with the Italian national soccer team. That was a, a, an accident. We happened to be sitting next to them because we were staying at the same hotel. So you didn't miss anything. <laughs> oh, thanks. Anyway, I'm signing off after that. That was a lot. Yeah, yeah. Nancy? <clears throat> well, um, I did read the whole book and <laughs> I thought it was, uh, I agree with whoever said it was tedious. I, I, he's not my favorite writer, but I thought it was a very interesting um, kind of framework that he set up of, you know, how do I talk about all of Rome? Um, what's, what's my framework? So I thought that was a very clever framework. Mm -hmm. And what I would think it would be especially nice is if you were going to Rome is to study that book. Um, because he really does tell you what to go look at um, and where did it come from. And um, we were in Rome about um, 20 years ago and, and we did see um, parts of Mussolini's Rome, like the balcony and stuff, but I had, I had no idea that there were still all these insignias all over the buildings and um, bullet holes and stuff like that. So it would have been kind of fun to look for that, um, as well as for earlier things. And, and this guy's not a historian, um, whatever he is. Um, but I think it's kind of a remarkable effort. You know, otherwise, how do you write about Rome to show people all these things? You know, you really wouldn't want a guy that, say, went from east to west or something and said, well, here you've got this from the fourth century and over here in the next block you've got something from the 20th century and um, so I, I thought it was really um, quite an interesting way of doing what he did. And uh, Robin I wanted to ask did your group have a, a purpose other than to look at northern Italy? Did it have a focus? Well Smithsonian always has like a tour guide you know like the details are you going to get who sleeps where and all this kind of stuff. And then they have a expert. They had a lecturer who was from a Canadian, but taught at Santa Barbara, California. And he taught about art, architecture and history. And so he did like slideshows every uh, couple times during the session and would talk about what we'd see the next couple days. 
So, okay, so it was. Oh yeah, it was kind it was of very general. educational. And then he would do like, we had um, local guides everywhere, but he would do like, kind of like special guiding. You know, go to see this or that. His specialty. He, he's written a couple of books about Sicily. <laughs> you know, um, and right now because of COVID, I think he got deported because he couldn't work at Santa Barbara, and you have to work so many uh days or you know what i mean and um i think he's probably back in in canada hmm. and basically out of a job because he's a tour guide and there aren't any tours yeah yeah it's hard. but i one thing that you mentioned and i think lynn mentioned too is i didn't know any of that stuff about italy and mussolini um you know you hear a few sentences but it was that was quite interesting <laughs> And he spent a lot of money doing not a lot of good. <laughs> I mean, he, he bankrupted the a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, he bankrupted the country, building yep. all these austere concrete bunkers. We could do it again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right in the United States. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, the wall here, huh? Okay, how about Sarah? You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Sure. I'm feeling guilty tonight because I only got halfway through the book. I'm Don't. sorry. To say. And I listened to it on audiobooks. Um, and it was read by a British guy who really had a terrible time pronouncing the Italian um, like locations and names and even his pronunciation for just basic words um, were very different from what we use in, in America. So it was um, entertaining, I guess. Um, I, I have, I've been feeling like I've been caught up in this warring, just layers upon layers of, of warring factions. Um, and, and that, I think, I would agree with Nancy that it, it was tedious to to follow all of the um, the successions of people that were and popes included. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that the, the the pious popes are are in the ninth century were murdering each other, and it was even considered to be acceptable. Um, how did you like that passage where one of the popes? I guess, exhumed the one before him to prove that he was not a, an honorable pope, that he had gotten his position dishonorably because, and in order to prove it, he dug up the dead pope mm. that, that, he, that he had succeeded and, and sat him in a chair. Do you all remember this? Sat him in a chair, dressed him in his pope's clothing and got a, um, a jury to listen and try the guy. And because he didn't respond, it was proof that he was crooked. And, <laughs> and so then they tore off his clothes and threw him in the river. Um, uh. so I guess by the time they fed us, or fed me that story, I was grateful just for a little bit of, of human drama and, uh, and emotionally charged, you know, just the story behind all of the the warring factions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think that um, I I'm not a very religious person, but I thought that the uh, the power and control that the Catholic Church held sway over the country, and it's not just Italy. The uh, in basically in Spain, it's it's the government, it's it's the church, and the military. You know what I mean? It's like it's not really about religion, I don't think, or, or you know, what we think of religion today. Power. Yeah, it's about power. Yeah. You know, so anyway, yeah. Okay, Rachel. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't, I haven't read the book and I've actually done, um, I need to go back and read it from the beginning because I've pretty much skipped around because I started, mm -hmm. I started it late. I didn't start it till this weekend and I wanted to get as much as I could for tonight. Um, but I was really, um, it's funny, I thought at the beginning, I was really fascinated by his, the decision to use the the sackings. I thought it was a good idea. And I agree with other folks who've read that I, I couldn't, 
grasp onto that I just glazed over. And, but the part that was really riveting to me were the, like those stories about the human drama, like what life was like for actual Romans. And then obviously the religious, all the religious history was interesting to me. And he actually, I thought does a pretty good job of talking about that time period in terms of um, the Catholic church and, um, and yeah, like really bringing out the power the power struggles and the power dynamics of, of that whole time. So that part I, I was, I read really closely and it sticks with me. The other part, I think I would need to like make myself a timeline and like a felt board to kind right. of keep track of all the, all the details. I thought the part, the parts about uh, women's rights mm. and um, you know, what they had to eat. And it wasn't a straight line, like women before the Victorian area, were had much more say about what they could do and owning property. It, it was, I thought that was interesting. Who's next? Okay, Paula. Yeah. Right You're on mute. I'm one that didn't finish the book either. But after listening to some of your comments, I might be willing to, you know, give it a second chance. And and I thought that it was um, the part where that he talked about the fact that they hadn't, you know, bothered to eliminate lots of the symbols of the how do you say it? fascist 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 fascist. I don't know. And especially in this time when here in America we seem to be trying to eliminate anything that's negative that they don't, you know, the Italians didn't really take much effort to, to do that. And that surprised me. Did you notice any of those symbols, Robin? You see, we never went to Rome. We were in oh, Northern. I thought you went to Rome. No, no, no. Um, I read this <laughs> book because Smithsonian typically would give us a list of books to read or, you know, that you could read. And I've read books before, but this time they didn't give us anything. And so I read DK. Oh. guidebook DK and then I read this book and it like before we went to Spain I read um, Iberia and uh, the Rose and the Thorn and so or the history of the Basque so I mean I just read this because Spain or because Italy has so much history there's no mm-hmm. way you you could even get a yeah any bit of it have you gone on other Smithsonian tours <laughs> yeah we went to two of them to Spain, one to southern Spain, one up to uh, Camino del Santiago. Because I wondered how that compared with your other tours. Excellent. They're excellent. But Italy has more history in like one square mile than most other places. That's all. Yeah. And I mean, the history for the the Italians was the, uh, and you, Rachel and Joe, probably know this better than I do, you know, you had the, um, there were the people, Etruscans, before the Romans, and then you had the Romans, and then you had, um, you know, the Goths and the Visigoths. I mean, it got confusing. I mean, they all wanted the ports. They all wanted the trade. Um, and then you have the Byzantine Empire, and it was just, it was a lot. And they basically spent all their money building churches, you know. You say I, was, I was interested in that little vignette about St. Peter. At St. Peter's, they dug underneath and got the body out. And then they, even at that time frame, they realized it couldn't have been St. Peter because <laughs> it wasn't the right size body. I thought that was kind of an interesting, mm-hmm. but they quickly hid the bones or got rid of the bones so that it still was the myth that St. Peter was buried under St. Peter's. The other thing that struck me that was interesting was how many times it was sacked in the early years, but a lot of the buildings weren't destroyed. They would buy their way out of it with gold, Mm -hmm. that people wanted money to not destroy it. And I thought that was kind of an interesting Think mm-hmm. that they survived. Many things survived over the years because they paid their way out. So we didn't finish either. But <laughs> I'm gonna. I'd like to go back and read the end. You know, the, mm-hmm. several of you have 
talked about that last chapter or two. And I think that would be with Mussolini would be a very interesting one. So that's it. Cool. Okay. Um, would you travel to Italy after reading the book? Yeah. Okay. I would Definitely. travel Peggy to Italy and I are going, before Peggy reading, and I are going reading the year. book. <laughs> Who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'd travel almost anywhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would get out of Dodge here. Um, and a couple of you mentioned um, including a timeline. Yeah. I, think that would I thought really a, time, a timeline would have been really helpful. Right. Um, and also, I didn't find those maps of Rome itself that helpful. I mean, it, it, it didn't seem to really change that much. And what would have been helpful is a map of, of Europe uh, mm -hmm. for each of those eras to see, you know, exactly where these different groups People came were coming from. from. Uh, yeah. But a timeline would have helped uh, give context to, to all those details that he was providing. And uh, one thing that kind of bothered me about his writing style was, uh, I agree with Nancy that, you know, tremendous effort, certainly, and amazing, but he would do flashbacks mm -hmm. um, from one page to another, and, and he also repeated, there were several times where the same sentence was repeated about a pope or about a this or, you know, somebody else, and I didn't, I don't know if the editors just didn't catch that, or I, I just found that kind of annoying at times that he, he didn't stick with, you know, where we were. It was, it was enough where we were, there was so much stuff. And then all of a sudden he's going backwards. And uh, I don't know, but yeah, I enjoyed it. He was having fun and was not in, he was having fun and wasn't incredibly edited. But I, I think once again, I think one of the things he really had fun with was the entire religious thing, which is obviously one of his shticks. And, and the way he showed how Rome stole the Christian religion was quite remarkable. I mean, after all, this was a religion that started off in Jerusalem and Constantinople and all that area. And Rome basically took it away and moved things that were never there to Rome. And I think that was very interesting the way he showed it's that. Levitsky. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that was... whole part. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say that whole part about the um, the relics and the kind of the stealing okay. and the, and essentially the making up <laughs> of some of the relics of the saints and just I, I yeah it was just fascinating um, yeah yeah what we heard when we were both in Italy and in Camino del Santiago was um, having the relics was a big business and so you would I mean they made this up for uh, Camino del Santiago, because there was no way that that person would, or that religious person would have been out there at that time based on even rudimentary history. And, but they could make so much money, you know, because they could sell stuff, they could um, have ho hostels, they could food and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing I was going to say was Susie Saxel gave me her comments. She agreed with a lot of you about the um, timeline. She said there were uh, major gaps in the history. I thought she said like a thousand years. Um, but then a lot of history from 1860 when they were, uh, Italy was, the city states are being consolidated um, under Gardelli or whatever his name was through 1944. The other thing she said, which was interesting, was that the whole book was pretty much about the Catholics. You know, and, and, and she said there were other religions there. The Jewish people had, you know, they weren't as prominent, um, but that they didn't get much space. Yes. One thing that we found when we went there, especially in Venice, is Venice is, um, Venice was a republic. It's not a democracy, but it was the most uh, democratic of all. It was republic like um, Greece, but it was the most democratic of all Italy. And the Doge's palace, they had like a attached prison and they had, um, they would elect a head person, which is a guy, of course. And then they had a council. But if you 
messed up. They didn't want their city to be, um, have a bad reputation. So you didn't want to, um, it was very mercantile. Okay. It was all about business. And, um, if you, uh, took advantage of somebody, they would bring you up to court and they, you would have to serve some time in the prison. If you took advantage of somebody uh, financially, or if you didn't, um, honor your contract or anything. So Venice was, and they also in Venice, there was, um, it's in the, um, I don't know, like the state of Veneto. There is a small town outside of Venice that very early on had COVID. And they said that Venice was um, smarter than our current administration. Venice, when they had the plague, they had two islands that they used as quarantine to put people. Um, and the word quarantine comes from quattro, which, which to them was like 40 days because they had all the um, ships coming in and traders. And so they knew that if something came in, it could infect their whole city. So they had two islands and these, you know, they weren't like um, throwing them like the lepers, they were taking care of them, but they would quarantine them. And um, they did of course get the plague, but they were pretty um, ahead of their time before the microscope. So they didn't know anything about germs. Mm -hmm. But you know, was, Robin, um, you're yeah. being very you're being very kind to them. You know, there's a whole bunch of Chinese villages outside of Milan where there's only Chinese workers. That's why there's a large Chinatown in Milano, because uh -huh. um, the Chinese workers make goods which are then sold as made in Italy. So anything that's inexpensive that says made in Italy has been made in uh, Chinese, Chinese factories in Italy, just outside of Milan, and that's where it really started. And the towns just north of Milan were all the Chinese. Wow. Workers housed in dormitories and they're the ones where the bosses fly back and forth and stuff like that oh okay because the stuff we buy that says made in italy if it's if it if it also doesn't say gucci it was made by a chinese worker who's living in italy for a wow. while wow yeah that's pretty rude mm -hmm. the, the chinese food is good in milan as a result though <laughs> it is yeah we we were there about 10 minutes and then we were off <laughs> it would have been impressive I wanted to say to Sarah, I admire you if you could listen to this book. <laughs> I, I, I saw Susie when she, a couple of days after she got back from Israel on the street out here on Main Street, and she was trying to catch up and she said, I'm listening to it. I think she was in her car driving around listening to it. And I was just amazed because I found, I'm not good at, at listening to books, period but I don't know how you would keep track of anything. Um, or, you know, I, I would just, I'm sure be my eyes, my ears would glaze over, I think, if that's but possible. How long would it take to listen <laughs> to the book? It's about 12 hours. Oh my God. But unlike Phyllis, I actually did kind of skim over it and I started analyzing the guy that wrote the book. Because <laughs> I thought, yeah, he's he's just absolutely smitten with the information that he has absorbed like a giant sponge. I mean, the guy is his brain is is pretty awesome for him to not only have recorded all this stuff, but to be able to to express it in a relatively short book. I don't know how many pages it is, but I thought I thought it was quite the literary effort, even though it wasn't my style of book, really. Um, but, I, and I, I always enjoy a British accent. It was written, it was, I think it, yes, it was read by a Brit, and it was written by a British man as well, right? I think that that's yeah, what the audio books do. They try to get a voice that's similar to the author. Hmm. So, um, so that's why, and a lot of people, I think it's just Americans that complain about the pronunciation because mm -hmm. the British don't have any problem listening to the British guy reading the British written book. So, um, so I just, I wrote along with it. I decided I just wanted to take it all in and, and I wasn't really that interested in, in all of the, um, the wars and someone that's really into especially military history would be fascinated with that first half of the book. I didn't get past that first half, as I said, but um, 
but I, I, do, I do give the guy credit for being able to absorb and then regurgitate that volume of information was encyclo it was beyond encyclopedic, wasn't it? Wasn't it kind of fantastic? That yeah, there's a lot, a lot of detail. It, it um, was incredible. Has anybody read History of Homo Sapiens? No. Uh, it's a, it was again reviewed, I think, in Economist, but it's like this. It's got, it's got the entire history well, according to this person, it's kind of like that. Um, uh, uh, was a cancer, the emperor of all diseases. Mm -hmm. But this is about the history of Homo sapiens from the beginning, from the Neanderthal all the way. And he kind of messes up when he gets to the uh, uh, current times. But that much detail. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, well, you're probably not going to take any more recommendations from me. But I thought it was a good book. <laughs> it would take you about two years to read it. <laughs> it's got great reviews. <laughs> he got some good reviews, yeah. From people that probably didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> they just skimmed it. Well, oh, thanks God. for your pictures. I especially love that Bolzano photograph. Did you take oh. it yourself? Yeah, with my Samsung Incredible. 7. Incredible. That was a gorgeous picture. Oh, thanks. Yeah. There were a lot of lot of less gorgeous pictures too, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm going to head off to give emotional support to the Democratic Convention right now. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Lynn. Yes. <laughs> we just want to say how how good it feels to be connecting with people on the island. We miss oh, it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Lovely to be here actually. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. it's, it's been hard. Yeah, next summer, one way or the other. You're gonna get here. <laughs> We're gonna yeah, get We miss you, we miss you. Yeah, yeah. See you Love in September. <laughs> What's that? See you in September. Abs well, oh yeah. On Zoom. On Zoom, that <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> We're, going, We're going to your house. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> That's the tradition. We'll bring, call you from your living room. Right, bring something to eat and, yeah, and bring we'll the cookies. Up. Yeah, pretend we're on the porch. <laughs> what's the September date? Paula, the what's the date? 15th? It's the 15th. Okay. 15th. Yeah, we'll get it on the calendar. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Robin. And okay. we love the pictures. Thanks. And oh, well, it thanks. Was great. thanks a bunch. Thank you, Joe. Sign thank off. You. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin.